There are some studies, legitimate studies, that are out there suggesting that if you consume sucrose, like sugar, you're going to lose weight. Now, I wasn't born yesterday. I know that, yes, someone could eat a bunch of sugar but still be in a caloric deficit and probably lose weight. Would there be unintended consequences later on down the line? More than likely. But when we look at this study that's in question, it does raise a very viable concern and something that we should look at. Because what this study in particular was looking at was something called FGF21, which is a protein that is released when we consume certain things, in this case sugar, sucrose, and it actually is a metabolic regulator. Like FGF21 is a protein that's being researched a lot because it improves your glucose, it improves energy expenditure by increasing brown adipose tissue, there's rodent model papers, and there's some decent human model data. So this study was published in the journal Nutrition and Biochemistry. And they basically determined that in this study, in mice, that the acute feeding of sucrose, table sugar, actually increased hormones that ultimately reduced weight. Pretty wild. I mean, if that actually worked, it might be kind of cool, right? They could just eat pixie sticks and drop fat. Now, they mainly found that this occurred because of this increase in FGF21. So in mice, they gave them either a high starch diet, a high sugar diet, or a control diet, like normal rat chow or mice chow. The sucrose group, the mice that ate the high sucrose diet, actually lost the most weight and had the most energy expenditure. So the amount of energy they expended was significantly more than the high starch group or the control group, which is so bizarre. Now on the surface, it kind of makes sense because you're thinking, okay, this is uh, sugar, and maybe it just gave the mice energy so they ran on their wheel more and they ultimately ended up burning more. That would make sense, right? Like you consume something that gives you energy and you're like, ah, I gotta run, I gotta run. But it actually wasn't that kind of energy expenditure. They found that it increased their brown adipose tissue. So it increased uncoupling protein. So these mice ended up burning more fat just at rest because from a thermogenic side of things, they were just basically emitting more heat the issue that we have is that in an acute situation, like short term, short term, if a healthy mouse eats a bolus of sugar, they might expend more calories from regular energy like movement and from this FGF21 driving up more like heat expenditure. But chronically, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think chronically they would actually fare better? You think if they continued on this for a while, there would be unintended consequences? Would they end up with more inflammation? How would it work out? We also have to ask ourselves the question, and we'll get to this, is FGF21 the same in humans as it is in mice? Like, can we take this study and say, hey guys, sugar's fine. As a matter of fact, it might increase fat loss. Just because we saw it in mice doesn't mean it's that way in humans. Also, how practical is looking at uncoupling protein and like dissipating calories as heat in the real world? Because for instance, in order to really get a benefit from uncoupling proteins, you need to be in cold exposure. And mice also drive a significantly higher response from brown fat than humans do. And again, I'm getting somewhere with this. I'm just trying to unpack it all so that we really look at this directly because it could be scary to tell people it's okay to just eat a bunch of sugar because it's gonna actually make you lose more weight. We also have to address inflammation. There's some evidence that suggests that chronically high sucrose intake does lead to acute and chronic inflammation. This could stand in the way of you know, insulin sensitivity as time goes on, making it so that the sugar that one consumes isn't even really working properly anyway because the person is insulin resistant. One could theorize that if you consumed a lot of sugar in one sitting and you were active, you'd use all those glucose molecules and things would be fine. But let's face it, most of us are not consuming sugar and then being active. Let's take a look at another study, one that was published in Diabetologia. It was a 16-week study and it took a look at insulin-resistant people. They put them on a high-carb diet or a high-fat diet or a high-protein diet. Well, in this particular case, the high-fat and the high-protein diets, they lost significantly more weight and had better overall blood markers through and through than the high carb diet, even though calories were matched. Okay, the high fat and the high protein diets lost 2.8 kilograms and 2.7 kilograms more weight, respectfully, than the high carb group. So what this tells us is someone's current metabolic state plays a very big part. So when we take mice that are not necessarily metabolically damaged, we give them sugar and they lose weight, that's not directly the same as saying, hey, 
you're an insulin resistant human that has a hard time with carbohydrates, let's give you a high sucrose diet. That may not work, but I wanna investigate it more because there was a study published in obesity that actually really illustrates what's going on with this whole FGF21 thing. So in this case, they gave humans sucrose, table sugar, and they monitored this FGF21 level, this protein. They monitored it at 15, 30, and 120 minutes. And they did see that in a healthy person, sugar increased FGF21 quite significantly, and the FGF21 decreased blood flow to the striatum, the portion of the brain. But in overweight people, it did not. So in overweight people, the sugar did not increase FGF21, and, well, not as much at least, and it did not decrease blood flow to the region of the brain that would tell the person to not eat as much sugar. What do I mean by this? FGF21 is a metabolic regulator. So when a healthy person consumes a lot of sugar, FGF21 will increase energy expenditure to modulate for that sugar and also tell the brain, hey, you don't need to eat quite as much sugar. Like you got enough, negative feedback loop, back it down. Just like if someone were to take a big shot of testosterone, it's gonna be a negative feedback loop that's gonna allow to shut down endogenous production, right? So when they consume sugar, this negative feedback loop basically tells them you don't need to eat more sugar. In unhealthy or overweight people, it did not do this. This is exactly the point here. Healthy people, can probably consume sugar just fine because it's going to tell them to stop eating it and to actually burn it. But where is the line drawn? Overweight people consume sugar and they just keep going and going. They also found in this paper that FGF21 was positively associated with BMI. So the higher the FGF21, the better the BMI score and the better the overall like waist circumference and overall body weight. The fact that this is impaired in overweight people tells us so, so much. But what's interesting is that sugar is not the only thing that increases FGF21. That's where we have to get a little more granular. There was a study published in Genes and Nutrition that believe it or not, found that a low protein diet increased FGF21. Why is this? Well, they found in this low protein diet that FGF21 increased and uncoupling proteins increased and brown adipose tissue increased. So all these effects that would be metabolically good by many things. Does that mean that we should be eating a low protein diet? The reason that I say this is we don't wanna be, be chasing some molecular mechanism because there's many different ways to get that same molecular mechanism. Eating sugar might increase FGF21, which might make us burn fat. But in that same token, so does a low protein diet. And if we ate a low protein diet, we'd be missing out on the thermic effect of protein. We'd be missing out on the satiety aspect of protein. We'd be missing out on the resting metabolic rate increase with muscle mass from protein. We'd be missing out on the recovery from protein all by chasing this FGF21. So what is the takeaway from this entire thing? So I took it upon myself to come up with a few ways that we can increase fat loss by leveraging some of this FGF21 stuff. So I've got a few different kind of methods here. Now, first and foremost, I don't think that you should go out and seek sugar as a means of fat loss. If it slips its way into your diet occasionally, it's not the end of the world. But I still think it makes the most sense to opt for lower sugar options whenever you can. For what it's worth, I put a link down below for 30% off through Thrive Market, which is an online membership-based grocery store. If you use that link down below, you sort by like sugar-free items. There's a bunch of different like snacks and treats and things like that that don't have sugar. If you like the sweet things and you just want to have things that are not going to have sucralose and not going to have aspartame, but they're going to have maybe stevia, monk fruit, there's a plethora of options there. I also created some nut butters and things like that that are sweetened with allulose. Like there's a cinnamon Brazil nut butter. There's a chocolate hazelnut that's a lot like Nutella that's sweetened with allulose. Highly, highly recommend those if you just need something that's gonna give you that sweet fix. I mean, they are nut butters, so they have a decent amount of calories, but if you're doing low carb, they make a lot of sense. But point is, that link down below, that's 30% off whatever you wanna get through Thrive Market. You just use that link and it gets you 30% off the entire grocery cart and a free $60 gift. And you using them is a big support of this channel because it's how we continue to do what we do. So that link, top line in the description.
So here's a few different things that you can do. For one, if you are looking to improve sort of a thermic effect to get a similar effect that you might get with sugar, the best thing you can do is the glaringly obvious thing, increase your protein intake. Now, this might be something you've already heard before, so don't skip through it because I've got some other good ones. When you consume protein, 20% of the calories in the protein you consumed alone are being used just in the sheer metabolism of that protein. So for every 100 calories of protein that you consume, you're really only absorbing 70 to 80 actual calories from it because 20 to 30 of every 100 calories is used just in the sheer metabolism of it. So that's way better than any benefit you'd get from FGF21 with sugar, just so you know. Okay, so definitely lean into the protein first. Second of all, if you're trying to increase fat metabolism a little bit, MCT oil is pretty darn potent with this. It doesn't mean it's going to make you literally burn fat, but MCT oil does absorb quickly into the portal vein, so it directly absorbs into the bloodstream without having to go through these different phases of like digestion and enzymatic function like other fats do. So what happens is you get an increase in adrenaline that actually increases your resting metabolic rate a tiny bit. That's why there's actually a little bit of sort of a catecholamine adrenaline response when you have MCT oil. So take like an MCT powder, or MCT oil, and mix it up with your coffee, but just remember that there's calories in the oil. So it's unlikely that you're gonna offset the calories that you got from the oil with the fat burning. So what I would recommend is if you're going to do it, try to be in a somewhat fasted state or be on a relatively low carb diet. That's why people that consume a lot of MCT oil, a lot of times they're people that are doing keto and things like that. Okay, then the strategic time to use sugar. If you are not overweight, the occasional acute bolus of sugar could actually work. Here's what you need to know though. Sucrose doesn't have to be table sugar. Sucrose is also naturally occurring. Okay, remember, there's glucose, there's fructose, and then there's sucrose. Sucrose is merely a combination of glucose and fructose. It just so happens that table sugar is sucrose, but that is ultra refined. There are fruits that are rich in sucrose as well, right? For example, like a kiwi is pretty decently high in sucrose. So you could literally just do a Google search, like fruits highest in sucrose. If you were to consume a nice bolus of like 50 or 60 grams of carbohydrates from fruit, it's not all going to be fructose. It's going to be a little fructose, a little glucose, and a little sucrose. But you might find that occasionally spiking yourself with this, if you're healthy already and not metabolically dysfunctional, this could increase FGF21 and it could actually be good for you. I don't need to spend a lot of time explaining why, but essentially it can act as a metabolic regulator and it can improve glucose tolerance. The thing that you may wanna do is occasionally do that before you're gonna be very active because then you're getting a double whammy. You're getting the FGF21 effect and you're gonna be exercising and expending energy that way. So although it's not something that's gonna be monumental, it might be fun and give you a mental break while also allowing you to get a potential fat loss effect. The other thing that you can do that's in the same category of all this stuff is fiber. So in the same sort of category, we have a peptide hormone, okay? We have a gut incretin known as GLP-1. Now, in a healthy person, when they would have carbohydrates, there might be a little bit of a GLP-1 effect. That's what's gonna help modulate insulin levels. And you've all heard of like ozempic and semaglutide, it's talked about all the time but fiber is gonna be one of the biggest drivers of GLP-1. So sure, we can eat fiber because it's good for our gut and it's good for you know, our gut bacteria and it's satiating, but fiber also has a profound effect on this GLP-1, which signals glucose homeostasis and signals fat loss to occur as well. So remember, it's not just about the mechanical digestion of the fiber, it's about the hormonal gut incretin effect that comes when you consume fiber. So all these things, we're working on incretins and proteins and things like that. And lastly is a simple piece that I've talked about in a lot of my fat loss videos. Try eating more and moving more. The reason I mention this is because it makes so much sense with this whole sucrose discussion. If people are thinking, hey, I can have sugar to burn fat, the best way that you could wrap your head around that is say, okay, I'm gonna have naturally occurring sugar, but I'm going to make a concerted effort to also be very active. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna increase your metabolism in sort of a stepladder approach. You're increasing your calories and your sugar, <laughs> reluctantly, and then you're also increasing your activity to offset it. And eventually you're kind of rebuilding everything. It's like rather than being like weak and barely eating and barely moving, 
You're eating a little bit more, but you're moving more and recovering more and building more. You're becoming stronger and more vibrant in the process. So with all that, using these kinds of things in combination are just nice little tools to have in your arsenal to burn some fat and maybe occasionally enjoy some good food. I'll see you tomorrow.